thanks everyone for being here. I'll quickly set the context. As a core team of Zeroda, when we first started uh, Rain Matter Foundation in 2020, one of the moonshots that we thought we had was if we can somehow involve our customers who are the top one, two, three percent of this country, you know, kind of give forward in some way, right? Uh, or how Samir keeps asking me to tell, you know, invest in the future in some way, right? And we kind of have our customers' undivided attention when he's on our app, right? Because we deal with money and et cetera. So the question was, how do we expose, right? Uh, because one of the problems of just putting up projects on the on our platform was, you know, the, the, there is an issue with credibility. If something goes wrong, are we liable for it? We are regulated by SEBI, right? I mean, these kind of questions came in that we can't just showcase any project to our customers because uh, we have some kind of liability. In there. I think, you know, internally, K, memes, you know, we've all spoken about this, which is, I think eventually to create some kind of an impact, it, it you know, there has to be some citizen movement. Right, and I think we have a right spot because of you know, the success we've had, uh, you know, luckily as a business, that to be able to make probably small impact amongst large audiences. Uh, so we are you now 1.2 crore customers today, and and like I said, they're probably in the top one, two, three percent of this country, and and they have the wherewithals to be able to actually give forward. We've been brainstorming an idea, like you know, when when customer comes on our. Web, web page, we have this portfolio page, right? And where we show asset allocation saying, this much to equities, this much to debt, this much. So there the idea was, can we somehow show like a section saying, this is for your future. And you know, the person clicks on it. And then we have a bunch of projects listed and you know, we enable him to invest in those. That's when you know, we heard about the social stock exchange. Right? Uh, and the finance minister first put it out in the budget and then uh, we part of a few discussions um, before SEBI actually put out the final papers on this. The reason we are excited is because it now allows us to kind of experiment on this idea, which is, uh, you know, because social stock exchange is regulated by SEBI, which allows us the freedom to experiment, which is to actually go position these projects which are listed on the exchange to our customers and see if we can somehow get all our customers involved in it, right? So thanks, Hemant. You know, Heyman for everyone heads the social stock exchange. Uh, I was just telling Heyman that uh, the first time we got on a call, this was very unlike anyone who's ever worked at a stock exchange. You know, because I've spoken to, you know, I've been in the stock broking industry from 2005 onwards. Uh, I've never had a conversation like the conversation I had with Heyman the first time he spoke. Um, so yeah, so we have Heyman here. Uh, the idea was to get Heyman to explain social stock exchange because I think it gives opportunity to everyone here to kind of leverage the stock, social stock exchange uh, to list projects and get more people involved. And given you know all this funding constraints that's already kind of creeping up in the country, you know, is there a way to get more people involved uh, behind projects? Uh, I got Boone from Zeroda, and so we both. The last question, I think, all of you, whenever you have anything to ask Heyman, uh, you can you know ask questions. So Heyman, maybe you know you can start off giving some background about yourself. Like, like what I just asked, you know, how did you end up in a stock exchange, you know? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then maybe from there, you can take it forward. I spent most of my working life in a large organization called Citibank uh, in India, as well as uh, in, in, in the US. Uh, but somewhere inside me was this growing urge to do something more socially useful with my life. Uh, but there was always this apprehension, kya hoga? what will happen if I step out of this comfort zone that I've built for two decades, right? But finally I decided I'll do it. And by God's grace, around the same time, BSC was looking for somebody to head a CSR initiative that they had launched called BSC Samman. So I ended up at BSC, not being a part of the stock exchange. I still am not a part of the stock exchange, to be honest which is probably why I don't sound like a... <laughs> uh, but helping companies connect with a network of 1,500 NGOs that we had built over the course of a year and a half, two years. And believe me, when I joined Samman, I did not know how to spell CSR. So it's the last six years, seven years have been tremendously educational for me as a person. Having a technology background, I realized that one of the things that the CSR space lacked was a platform that would allow matchmaking, would allow project monitoring and reporting, built a platform, 
the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, the regulator for the CSR uh, Act, uh, liked the platform, acquired it, right? In the meantime, BSC also assigned me the responsibility of running that technology incubator, which I, I'm still running, so I wear two hats at BSC. I run, I head the social stock exchange as well as the incubator. Into 2019, uh, like Nitin said, the finance minister announced the creation of a social stock exchange uh, in India. There were two or three things that were unique about her announcement. One being, again, something that Nitin mentioned, it would be under the purview of the stock exchange regulator, namely SEBI. Second was that it would be for for-profit and not-for-profit organizations, unlike other countries, which kind of, one had a separate platform, two, it was either for not-for-profits or for-profits. And third was that it would be essentially a fundraising platform that could be used by anybody, right? as long as you had a social intent. So when in July 2019 this announcement came out, uh, SEBI very quickly did some pre-consultation because of the Saman link, I was a part of that pre-consultation. So I've been fortunate enough to be a part of the journey right from the beginning. Yeah, uh, And then uh, there were two committees that got formed in quick succession. One broadly spoke about the architecture of the social stock exchange, learning partially from the seven other countries that had experimented with a social stock exchange. And there were two or three things that this committee said. One was that it would be a segment on the stock exchange itself. Uh, how many of you who are not from Zerodha have stock exchange accounts or hold equity, either on Zerodha or not on Zerodha? I'm not going to <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, okay, good. So, uh, if uh, so, some of you at least will then know that the stock exchange that we see, which is the Sensex and the Nifty, etc., actually just one segment. It's called the main board, right? There are several other segments in the stock exchange. As an example, there's an SME segment. Uh, small and medium enterprises companies can come and list. Uh, there is now uh, a, B, uh, a startup segment also that got launched a couple of years ago. So the social stock exchange would be a segment on the existing stock exchanges. So as of now, there are both BSC and NSC have a social stock exchange segment. It's important because over the course of these, uh, ever since SEBI got created, the capital market regulatory framework has been maturing, right? And you guys have been a part of that journey for the last uh, 15, 18 years. Right? Um, and therefore, it actually provides a very stable foundation to set up a stock exchange like this, which no other country had, right? Every other country set it up as an independent body. The second thing that uh, the uh, this, this it was called the working committee said is that the capital markets ecosystem is something completely new for the social development sector, right? Most people are not aware of what equity and debt, etc., are. Forget about listing on of fundraising on the stock exchange. And therefore, there should be a fund that gets created, which is called the capacity building fund, whose purpose will be to educate not-for-profits and equally importantly, the donors and investors on how to leverage the social stock exchange, right? So that capacity building fund has now been created. It's a fund under NABARD uh, and uh, it's starting to get operational now. Um, they're getting their terms of reference. They're getting their terms of reference together. How, how big is the fund? So the corpus is supposed to be 100 crores. They're starting out with 10 as the first tranche, where uh, I think NABARD and SIDBI and BSC and NSC have all put in uh, some money. Uh, it's open for contribution from others. And the third thing that uh, uh, the uh, working committee introduced was the one that most people are most familiar with. It's called the Zero Coupon Zero Principle Instrument. Right? The Zero Coupon Zero Principle Instrument was one way to take what happens today in the social development ecosystem, which is essentially donations and grants, and migrate that onto the stock exchange. So Zero Coupon Zero Principle Instrument is nothing but a donation or a grant with a fancier label, right? Zero coupon meaning no interest, 
zero uh, principal, meaning you don't get your principal back. Therefore, there is no financial return. It's only a social return. Uh, by the way, I'm summarizing like 70 pages of reports into three. <laughs> so I'm leaving out several things. So please pardon that. Um, that was shortly followed by a technical group right? that took what the working committee did and took it one or two levels down, turned it into operational uh, details. The first thing that the uh, working, uh, sorry, the technical group did was to say that any enterprise, for profit or not for profit, coming on to the social stock exchange has to prove it has a social intent. There was there's no legal definition of a social enterprise in this country. Uh, in fact, one of the members at the technical group insisted that one of the recommendations should be to create uh, a legal definition of social enterprise. Maybe that will happen as we mature, but as of now, there is no legal definition. So what we did is we said that, one, we will define a list of sectors in which you have to be working, one or more of these sectors. And we used um, the famous Schedule 7 of Section 135 as one of the inputs. We used the SDG goals as the second input. And we used Niti Aayog priority areas as the third input. Plus, we've added some new age sectors like migrant populations and access to uniform access to the internet, etc. And created a list of 15, 16 sectors. However, we also said that a majority of the work you do has to be in these 15, 16 sectors. Majority being defined as two thirds of your revenue for a for profit enterprise or two thirds of your expenses or beneficiaries for a not-for-profit enterprise, okay? So first filter, you have to be working in these 15, 16 areas. Second filter, you have to spend, your organization has to be doing majority of its work. Third filter, which will probably change with time, is that certain organizations were barred from being on the social stock exchange to start with, right? The first, of course, was religious and politically affiliated organizations. The second, is uh, corporate foundations or organizations that derive a bulk of their funding from a parent corporate body. And the reason for that was that they already have a source of fund and some of the larger ones can actually suck out all the money on this, right? So give the other guys a chance. Um, third was professional and trade bodies like the Board of Control of Cricket of India. May, may, it may not be the right place for them to be. <laughs> And then uh, housing, finance, housing companies, except for those in affordable housing. And there was a fourth criteria, which I think is more of a add-on or a preference and not such a filter as such, uh, not a yes or a no, which is you have to be working in uh, less developed areas, working in marginalized population, et cetera, et cetera. That one is more qualitative than quantitative, to be honest. Okay, so first step, you have to pass this criteria. Sec after that, the existing structure of the stock exchange is available for the for-profit enterprises. So you can do an IPO, you can use debt, right, etc. However, for a not-for-profit, life is not so simple because there is no existing structure for a not-for-profit. We broke that part up into two parts, that path for a not-for-profit into two parts. You register the organization first and then you raise funds. Unlike a for-profit where you do an IPO straight, there's no registration and fundraising separately. And that was done deliberately. That was done because most 95%, 96% of NGOs raise money at a project level. Right? So you are working in a village, in a hospital, or whatever the project is, you raise money for that. So a large NGO can have hundreds of projects running. And fundraising also typically happens at a project level not at the organization level. Therefore, let the NGO register once and raise funds as many times as possible. Okay, so that was broadly the thought behind. The other thing that has happened is that uh, how can an NGO raise funds on the social stock exchange? We spoke about zero coupon, zero principle, so that was the first obvious choice. Um, and then SEBI in its infinite wisdom also came out with the uh, criteria for a characteristics as they call it for a zero coupon, zero principle. The first being it has to be a minimum of one crore in size. 
So any NGO wanting to raise funds has to uh, fulfill that criteria. Second being that any funder, donor, investor, whatever you want to call, has to put in a minimum of two lakhs. Uh, and I will answer that question also. <laughs> right. Uh, the third, it has to be in a DMAT form, uh, which makes sense because any, if you think about it, anything on the stock exchange is in a DMAT form. And the fourth uh, was, uh, is that it has to be subscribed to a minimum of 75%. Let's talk about two and four. Right? Uh, two being the two lakh limit for an investor, four being the 75%. The 2 lakh actually comes from uh, SEBI's definition of a sophisticated investor. I think that's what it's called, right? Accredited investor. Accredited investor, right? So there is no formal way of classifying a person as being somebody who knows the risk they take when they put in money. That's an accredited investor is supposed to be an individual who knows, right? So therefore, without, without any other criteria being there, money has been used as a criteria. So if you can afford to put in two lakhs, you know what you're doing with your money. That's the basic reason behind the two lakhs. And we are pushing SEBI back saying, well, the guy is giving a donation. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen to his money? <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so it's one of those evolutions that the stock exchange, so SSC will go through. The second, and hopefully we'll come down, uh, we are currently pushing for 50,000. We'll see where we go with that. Okay. The second one I wanted to spend a little bit of time on was on the 75%, that it has to be subscribed to 75%. And the argument that I am putting to SEBI is that that limit actually is very project specific, right? There are projects where you can do with half the money also. Right? There are projects where you need 100%. You can't do without 100%. So rather than it being a limit that SEBI you mandate, let it be a limit that the NGO, you can maybe set a floor. You can say that 50% has to be raised. Okay. Below 50%, we will not. But let that limit above 50% be set by the NGO when they are applying for this. So again, uh, it's an ongoing process. And, and say, sorry, I just have one question. So if, if you try fundraising and you're not able to re raise 75%, can you go back and reduce your project cost and raise again as in? So I think that all of these will get answered uh, as we go along. Right, right now, there's no provision right. to do that. Right now, it's a straightforward. You file in a prospectus. Uh, currently, there's, it's 75% or whatever the prospectus says. So we'll have to figure all these uh, things and, out. And then how much time do they give to raise that? Yeah, so that's the... <laughs> good. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, but the other uh, kind of discussion we are having is that how long will an issue stay open on the stock exchange? Now, what's happening on the IPO side is that it's coming down. The window is actually shrinking, yeah. right? Um, but on the not-for-profit side, fundraising is not something you can do in T plus three, right? You can't. <laughs> uh, but but if you go back to how an IPO functions, also T plus three is actually the window where you officially kind of register your interest on the website and commit your funds through that ASBA mechanism. The fundraising actually happens long before the IPO opens. So whatever number we arrive at, I don't think it'll be three. I don't think it'll be three days. I don't think it'll be three months. It'll probably be closer to two weeks or 10 days. Whatever we num number we arrive at, it will still be you do fundraising before you come and open that off offer period. And, and unlike in an IPO, where you can always come back and invest any yeah. point of time. Here, you you as an investor can enter only during a... That's very true. Right. During the offer period. So there's no secondary trading in the zero coupon principal points. So uh, uh, it's another good question. Right. In its current form, right. see, ultimately, and uh, you trade value, right? There is a seller who thinks he's going to get some value out. There's a buyer who's going to think who can derive value from buying that. Ab donation, mein kya, what value will you derive? Right, so, no, it's, well, I'm being facetious about it, but actually it's an interesting question, right? Uh, and there are things like carbon credits. Can there be a social credit? Uh, 
but i don't know i, I think it will take time for that what part what about in the other social stock exchanges is are there anywhere where the zero coupon bond is tradable as in uh, so the other social stock exchanges nitin can broadly get classified into two kinds one are listing platforms which means an ngo or a for profit enterprise can come and list but there's no matchmaking there's no funding there's no trading the second is the ones that are dedicated to for profit enterprises only not for not for profit enterprises who can for example have a debt issue they can use a a, a bond on that stock so zero coupon zero principle doesn't happen anywhere else got it and uh, i had a question as in why bring for profits into the mix as in but because for for profits you anyways have sme segment etc right? if if the business isn't that big why bring in a for profit segment within the social stock exchange so the official response would be that uh, for profits are increasingly becoming a very integral part of the social development ecosystem right and therefore any solution any social stock exchange which is dedicated only for the not for profit would be an incomplete social stock exchange right and and i like i said 6 years ago i didn't know how to spell csr i now know a bit more than i did 6 years ago and i also strongly feel that social enterprises have that have a for profit motive will be a very very important part of the indian social a uh, global social development ecosystem uh, that's one the second is that uh, the zero coupon zero principle to my mind is a bridge between what is happening today on the offline world if you want to call it that and the online world right actually i think some of the other structures like development impact bond or social impact funds that we can talk about a little more are the are probably the fund raising structures of the future and that to my mind is ideally when there is a for profit and a not for profit coming together and delivering far more social impact than either one of them could have done individually so as part of the deliberations and the ensuing discussions there is also mention of uh, development impact bonds in the apqs is that an approved instrument or just zero coupon zero principal bonds no so as of now uh, there are three well on the for profit side you of course have de- ipos and debt etc but on the new instrument side there is the zero coupon zero principal the development impact bond is also an approved instrument uh, or the pay for success model as it's also called and social impact funds okay um, so there was uh, for those of you who know the sebi regulations uh, there's a there's a thing called aif alternate investment funds alternate investment fund funds come in three categories cat 1 cat 2 and cat 3 cat 1 or category 1 investment funds have a sub category called social venture funds right which existed even before the social stock exchange came into existence however the social venture fund as it existed then used to be a, a younger brother of a, a regular <laughs> fund right in the sense that it was it had lower hurdle rates it had lower uh, entry criteria etc with the introduction of the social stock exchange sebi actually has done away with social venture fund uh, renamed them as social impact funds but the most important change they made which a lot of people don't realize is that unlike let's say a venture capital fund a social impact fund can invest only in the social stock exchange okay which which in other words so let's say you have a mutual fund what they've done is they've converted it into a, a mutual fund kind of a structure so when you subscribe to a mutual fund right it will it will invest in shares that are traded on the stock exchange or what are called listed securities right unlike other thing like a venture capital fund invest in startups none of them are traded on any stock exchange right so the social venture fund in its original construct was like a venture capital fund it would invest in unlisted companies but those companies that had a social intent um, sorry uh, how do you define that as in you, you know like even for I mean, sorry to derail you here uh, how do you define someone has a sh- social interest so there was no definition uh-huh. the only the only criteria that and it's a very strange thing nitin 
the in the original social venture fund definition right they classified it as a fund that has a muted return that was their definition of a social venture so fund. there's no definition as what what mean no, what is how a muted return is no so in terms of operationalization there was a circular which laid out the framework so where is the social stock exchange right now in terms of operationalization okay so um, all of these committees uh, gave their reports i think uh, 2021 was july 2021 was the last report of the technical group then in july of 2022 sebi and ministry of finance started coming out with regulations they came out at, with a total of five regulations so far the last one in october which kind of gave a legal structure framework for the social stock exchange um both nsc and bsc now have licenses to operate the segment uh, we got our license in uh, december last week of december uh, nsc got their license in february second week of february i think and we now have 16 ngos registered remember registering versus fundraising we have now have 16 ngos registered on the social stock exchange at bsc and 14 at nsc we have not done any fundraising so far uh part of the reason for that i mean there several of these 16 have come and approached wanting to raise funds but we are kind of getting our documentation in place um for example the depository doesn't understand uh how i will depict a zero coupon zero principle instrument on an investor's cas right cas is a consolidated account statement that all of you will be getting listing your mutual funds and your equity investments right So, if you think about uh, zero coupon zero principle, is when you invest, you invest in two lakhs. The next day, the value of investment is zero, <laughs> right? <laughs> so they're trying to figure out. So there is some of these teething issues that are being worked out. I am hoping uh, that we <laughs> will have our first <laughs> fundraising listing happening next month uh, at BS. That's nice. Yeah. So. so uh, you know like coming back to those instruments that you talk, spoke about outside zero coupon zero uh, principle the social impact funds and the development bonds how can you maybe briefly explain how it works sure. okay i'll start with the development impact bond and normally i do it with a presentation but i'll try and do it <laughs> without one okay so what we'll do is we'll take an example as an illustration probably easier to do it that way so let's say there are um these five villages uh, that need clean water in every house right? uh there are three ngos that work are going to be working on this project right uh, they've divided the five villages amongst themselves and let's say uh the total cost of providing clean water to every household is about 1 crore rupees for these five villages now under a normal as an ngo the, the three of them would have gone to their donors got money tried to do this project with with or without success we don't know right let's leave that open for the moment there there is a, so there is a coordinating agency that comes and tells these ngos i will give you this 1 crore that you need okay i will give you this 1 crore only thing is you have to guarantee to me that at least 80% of the households will get clean water okay so it's called that's why it's called pay for success right so the ngo will guarantee to this coordinator that i will give at least 80% now the coordinator is obviously going to look at the track record make sure that the ngo can live up to their promise etc so what the coordinator will do is they'll also appoint a monitoring agency right somebody who can actually independently evaluate and say 80% got done hopefully 100% got done so then they will go to a risk investor and say listen i need 1 crore rupees i need it for about a year right i will give you for ease of my mathematical calculation 10% on this right so at the end of one year i'll give you 1.1 crore back but there's a condition if 80% of the household don't get water you'll get zero so that's why this guy is called a risk investor so obviously this person is earning that 10% at 
as a reward for the risk they're taking, right? It's, it's standard financial, right? You, when you put in money into the stock market, there's a risk. But you do it because you expect a reward in return. So now this coordinator has to provide, has, is getting one crore, but at the end of one year has to give 1.1 crore to. Now remember that one crore is going, going to be given to these three NGOs. They're not going to give anything back, right? So now this coordinator has to give 1.1 crore back to this risk investor at the end of one year. He's running his own organization, so he's got expenses of his own, right? And there's this monitoring agency they've appointed. They're also going to charge something, right? So at the end of the project, this entity will incur, let's, and again, keeping my math simple, 10% cost for the risk investor, and let's say 10% for all of these other things. Okay, so therefore, at the end of one year, they need 1.2 crores. So they will now go to an outcome funder and say, listen, I've got this great scheme for you, right? You, normally, you would have done one, one crore and done these five villages, but you wouldn't have known what, it could have been just gone down the drain, literally. Uh, your money could have gone literally down the drain. I, you need to give me money only if 80% of the households get clean water. Otherwise, you don't need to give me any money. But you don't give me one, you give me 1.2. So that is the, if you call the premium for getting an assured return on your money, to use the financial jargon, right? So that entity is called an outcome funder. Okay. So the outcome funder is somebody who provides money only if the outcome is guaranteed. The risk funder is the guy who provides money initially up front and keeps the project going. And there's a coordinator in the middle who's kind of, so there's a tripartite agreement between the outcome funder and the risk funder and the coordinator. Right. So that's a development impact bond. Now, the risk investor could take several other avatars. They could be a bank that's giving a loan. It could be other um, uh, kind of entities. It could also be an uh, uh, impact funder that is giving money. So the, it can take various variations to this, but that's the basic structure of a development. And plan. this 10%, what is the real math in the real world for this? As in how much? How much? <sighs> Actually, I didn't, I, to be honest, I don't know no. the answer. They, I know that they have been, I think, two or three the most famous one was called Educate Girls. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Right? And I don't know the maths behind it, but I do know that um, the second 10% that I spoke about, that was quite high. It was some 30% or almost. Uh, the second as in the... the monitoring agency and the, okay. the other... The cost admin of costs. operations. Yeah. As part of the event, so we have a forum called as Rain Matter Go. We collected a bunch of questions from various organizations. So I think you teed up it nicely. So the first question was, how does this process work on people giving the money on the other side, people taking the money? So what does the process look like on each side? Process? Yeah, in the sense that if somebody wants to donate money, what like what's the process for them? So this is a, a standard stock exchange, okay? There's, there's not, no different from buying anything else on a stock exchange. You need a broking account, you need a DMAT account if you want to give money. Right? And on your broker's portal, there will appear the zero coupon, zero principle that you can click on and then you can put in whatever Sorry, money. Sorry, so, uh, before, yeah, before we do it, on, so on the development impact bonds yeah. itself. So they will also be a new type of instrument on the social stock yes. exchange. So when you, so the people who turn up for buying, investing into social, so who is this? Is this the outcome investor or is it the risk investor? Who, who turns up at the social stock exchange? I'm having this exact conversation with one of the guys who wants to do a, a social impact bond. And we are still trying to figure out the exact stru operating structure, okay? The way I'm thinking about it right now, Nathan, and I have not validated this with SEBI or, is that actually we'll create a callable bond, right? Where uh, you have the risk investor being the initial investor, but that bond has this rider on top where after one year, the, the, so the outcome funder is not giving any money investing into that bond right now, but will have, there will be a call on them one year later where they will have to put in that money. Okay, that's what I'm thinking right now, but I'm, like I told you right in the beginning, I'm not a stock exchange expert, <laughs> right? But, but, but then would this be tradable? This can be tradable, yeah, yeah of course. Right. Okay. 
That's interesting. And uh, what is what has been the success of this product around? Because this is something which is tried and tested. Yeah, right? it's uh, had limited success. I think there were three of them in India, if I remember right. One was by this Educate Girls. Uh, one was by NSDC called Skill Impact Bond. And there was a third one that was by... But the thing, the interesting thing, Nathan, has been that these have all been closed ecosystems. For example, the NSDC one, they lined up uh, HSBC and MSDF and, you know, everybody was kind of a part of the discussion, a part of the design, a part of the implementation. On a stock exchange, it'll be very, very different, right? So, uh, because, but the other way to look at it, and which is what I keep telling people of the social stock exchanges, earlier, to do a DIB, there was no other way except to do a closed ecosystem. Right? There was no other way to publicize the fact that otherwise the cost would have been exorbitant. By being on a social stock exchange, you, to your opening remarks, you automatically get access to 1.2 crore zero dha customers, right? If I remember the number right. So therefore, it becomes a lot easier to for the investor to find these opportunities and for a, a, a issuer to actually tap into larger pools of capital. And how does, you know, like the person who is doing the managing the operations, etc. cetera, uh, how, what is the accountability there? What if the person raises money and blows it up? As in, like, uh, sure. like how, how do you solve for that? As in? No. So uh, I'm assuming the normal market, so the same thing can happen with a company that comes, floats a, debt instrument and um, over time I'm assuming that there will be a credit rating the system that will get developed for development impact bonds just like it exists for other types of bonds right people will have track records uh, Got it. part of the evolution <laughs> 1.0 right now <laughs> we and, move to and the third instrument you said the social impact, impact fund yeah how, how does that work so a social impact fund is like a, it's like a mutual fund um, so what, what earlier, uh, these alternate investment funds were all financial return based funds. So you got a muted return, but you got a financial return. A social impact fund can either be what SEBI calls a pass through fund, which means it can be a donation kind of fund. Think of a village development project, right? There is water, there is sanitation, there is health, there is all these things that need to be taken care of, right? So. Uh, create, if you could create a social impact fund for a block of villages, right? Where um, it's, uh, so there's no success model here. So where donors give money, people are interested in that block getting developed. There is a bunch of, there is a fund manager who receives the money. There is an accredited set of NGOs on the other side that will actually do the implementation. And each of those NGOs is given money on the basis of pre-agreed terms and conditions, and they carry out the project. That is one way of looking at a social impact. Fund. What, what is an accredited NGO? Is it accredited NGO currently has, again, no definition. Okay, it'll be somebody, so, the, sorry. So what, what, the way it'll work, remember what I said, a social impact fund can only invest in securities that are listed on the social stock exchange. So what these NGOs will have to do is they'll have to actually come float zero coupon, zero principal instruments. For So the health guy will have to fold one, float one. You know, the uh, water guy will have to float one. And then this social impact fund will buy units into each of these. Did that make sense? Are you guys with me? Okay, good. So the process of setting up a social investment fund, so that is that separate or is it similar to an AIF? It's similar to an AIF, but I think the fees and all is lower. So for, as an example, uh, I think a CAT1 AIF, you have a minimum investment limit of one crore, right? So the, here it's not one crore, it's two lakhs. Right? The fund size, I think, is 20 crore is the minimum limit. Here it's a lower limit. So they've reduced the limits, but still the structural, stay, you have to apply to SEBI, you have to get a registration, all that stays the same. Got it. One of the, you know, one of the issues, I mean, I'm just trying to figure if this solves for the problem. See, one of the issues I think, uh, you know, some changes in the taxation has brought in is that if a corporate is giving money to a foundation, I mean, to a Section 8, 
and the Section 8 in turn gives. You know, now there is a GST impact there. Uh, and so I'm trying to think, would creating a, a social impact fund where the corporate is the only investor, if you were to create this vehicle, does it then? Well, we'll have to think about this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, it's an interesting thought, but uh, I, we'll have to think about this one. Okay, got it. Sure. Yeah, so uh, one, one last question I had around this was, so when someone invests in a stock market, right? Uh, I think one of the reasons, you know, I, I've said this you know, before, you know, that one of the reasons I think a lot of participation in Indian stock markets has gone up over the last four or five years, and apart from the bull market, which is in terms of price going up, is also because mm -hmm. there is the corporate governance in the country is going up as well in some way. I mean, of course, there are slips here and there, but if you were to compare 10 years back to now, it's improved. Right. How does, because eventually if you need more participant, participation in the social stock exchange, you would need retail investors to be able to trust on the platform, right? What will social stock exchange offer? As in, is a belief that just because these are accredited NGOs putting up projects which is approved by SEBI, do you think that is enough for trust to come through? Or you know, how, how are you thinking about this as an exchange? So the one, uh in our discussions, the one aspect that we have not touched upon, which co also got introduced uh, in India, which is not there in any other country that tried a social stock exchange, was the concept of a social auditor, right? A social auditor is unlike a financial auditor, is an auditor who's supposed to certify the outcomes that have been created by the project that is being funded. And I'm using the word outcomes deliberately, not impact, because impact will throw a whole set of other questions. So the idea is that, can there be a third party verification of what's happening with your money? The social auditor function is not something that is restricted to chartered accountants. Uh, there is a training program, a certification program that there's an organization called NISM, which you guys will be obviously familiar with. Some of you may not be. Uh, National Institute of Securities Markets is a body that does certification programs for people wanting to be a part of the stock exchange, brokers and financial intermediaries and uh, other people. So they've launched a course on social audits. You don't need to know anything about auditing standards or how to how does a balance sheet look like or right. Uh, and it's an 11-module course. At the end, there's a certification exam, so you can take that. So part of the answer to your question, Nitin, is that every project that raises funds on the social stock exchange has to get audited by a social auditor. And who pays the cost? The, the NGO pays the cost, which means the project pays the cost, which means it should be a part of the funds that you raise. Got it. You, it should be. Uh, right. Yeah. The flexibility yeah. is there. Nobody's mandating it. Yeah, because today that, that whole ecosystem is quite expensive. You know, there's something that you know we internally keep talking about. Have you thought about this? As in, because you know, now the social audit becomes a very important part of the social stock exchange. Uh, the fact that it is quite expensive today to get social audit done, and how do you bring the cost down for that? As in, is it is it just more people taking up these exams? You'll have more social auditors, and eventually the cost comes down. Is that the right way to think about this? Yes. One is that uh, the capacity building fund is actually thinking about subsidizing the initial social audit costs. Um, see, part of the challenge is that social audit to an extent has to be a physical verification, right? And therein lies the challenge. Unlike doing a financial audit where you're looking at a set of books, increasingly most of them are online, digital in format. Part of the challenge is social audit has to be assessing on the ground, talking to beneficiaries. Uh, maybe some of it can over time become online also. But the more diverse your project is, the more you'll end up spending on the social audit. And it also becomes harder to predict the cost of a social audit. And part of the challenge, uh, Nitin, also is the fact that we are very early in this story. So as we, over time, benchmarks will develop, right? So what this capacity building fund has offered to do, and it's not been approved yet, is start sub subsidizing some of the initial so social audit costs um, so that it is not a heavy burden on both the donor and the NGO. From a market perspective, I think the eventual answer is 
that there will be a larger network of social auditors and therefore you will not have to have people travel and people. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. So, I have a tricky one for you. <laughs> you know, so, like usually, you know, when, when projects come to us, uh, the Rain Matter Foundation, right, as in, uh, because we're a regulated, you know, business which is funding this as well, so we care about risks quite a bit, right? Would the social stock exchange allow any type of project to come list on the, I, I'm saying which comes under all your criteria because some could be anti-establishment in a way as well, right? As in, you know, so which is, uh, like, how do, you, how do you decide? Will you allow anyone to list? Actually, it is a tricky question, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I don't have a straightforward black and white answer. One is that there are these three or four filters. So these three or four filters will probably take away a lot of what you're talking about, but not all of it. What, what I am trying to push for, uh, as we are constituting the offering documents, I'm also trying to push for a social audit of past projects as a demonstration of your ability to execute a project, as a demonstration of your track record, can you get a social audit done of the work you've done in the past? which will increase the cost of listings and therefore there is resistance to it. But I think they will be these oddball. I, I don't see a very, I mean, over time, we'll have to develop these guardrails and checks and balances. But you're right, I mean, shuru mein hoga. So the same issue happened with SME stock exchange, Correct. a bunch of still uh, oddballs. Like, if whenever an organization files a of a document, like what's the level of scrutiny on the document? Like, is there somebody looking into? So there is the no claim? merchant banker mandated, right. unlike uh, the other issues. Even a SME requires yeah, a merchant yeah, yeah, yeah. banker, although a different right. class of merchant bankers. Um, there is no merchant banker, but there is a due diligence process that we are building as a part of this listing process, where an advisor, we are calling them an advisor. Will, so that's an external party. Will do some level of due diligence. Also, you know, uh, in the start you said this will be, uh, because this is a new segment of the stock exchange, does it mean that for a broker like us, the f customer funds lying with us can be used for investing in social projects? Or does it require us to take money from the customer's bank account? I mean, you need to build, I mean, this is just an operational question, but so today what happens is if say, you know, you as a customer is holding a lakh rupees in our account, you can use this to buy stocks or invest in IPOs. I mean, you can't invest in IPOs now, but say you can buy stocks. Can the same funds be used for social stock exchange? Or does the money have to come from your bank account to the project? I actually don't know the answer. <laughs> okay, Sorry. Okay, okay, got it. No, because the easier it is for us to enable it. I the, hear you. Because every but new step you add, you know, the drop-offs mm. increases. You know, so. But yeah, but, but maybe you can take we it can, off. Yeah, we can talk about it offline. Right. Uh, it's an interesting, sure. No, I didn't think of that. I think we've spoken around this a bit. So, like, if somebody wants to list on the exchange, like, the process is set, or is that still work in progress? That's the piece that is work in progress. Got it. So, we have NGOs that have come to us Got it. and said we are ready. Right. But we are trying to get our act together. Got it. What's the complication, if I may ask? So, part of the complication is what you just asked, due diligence. Right? So how do you define due diligence? Part of the complication is that DRHP or the draft red herring prospectus cannot be a, a DRHP the way it is today. It will be too onerous for an NGO. And remember, this is at a project level. This is not at a company level. So imagine trying to replicate that 50 times if you want to fundraise 50 projects. So we are trying to make it simpler. I was surprised to learn that one DRHP actually has some eight or nine legal agreements that have to be signed amongst various parties. <laughs> Nobody will want to come. There was an analysis which looked at the average length of DRHPs and it's been consistently going <laughs> up over the years. So, so we're trying to actually, what we're trying, what is taking us time right. is two things. One is the due diligence standards because that is the tricky part, a little bit tricky here. And the second is trying to simplify the documentation and make it easier and less expensive and less time consuming and less resource intensive. It's actually quite great for you know, projects and NGOs that they have a distribution platform. But who's going to distribute? 
like in a sense, we know we will, right? As in for projects that we care about, I think we will actively go distribute. But how will it work otherwise? And who, who are the people who will go talk about it? You're expecting the NGOs to go, you know, try mobilize funds, et cetera, to the platform? Or do you expect like how you have investment bankers for IPOs, et cetera? I mean, like who's gonna do the job of going out there, putting the word for, because that's where the help is really required as well, right? I mean, apart from the distribution platform. A stock exchange is an ecosystem, right? You guys understand it far better than I do. There is a certain faith in that system that allows an investor like me to go and go to my whatever my broker is, to their terminal and say, I want to invest. My thought process on this, because this obviously keeps me up at nights, and my thought process is that initially, just like the SME segment, Initially, it will have to start with NGOs and known donors coming together, right? And kick-starting the engine, right? That initial friction, starting friction will have to over be overcome by, and there are, we have investors or donors, reasonably renowned people who are willing to put in right checks to kick-start that engine. There is no track record for, so if she wants to come and raise funds today, there's no track record, right? Even if I was interested, this is my favorite example, okay? Even if I was interested in conservation of rhinos in Assam and Kaziranga, right? I'll come across an NGO that has a ZCZP on BSC, but I don't know them, right? And they're sitting, whatever, 2,000 kilometers away. I think initially, a lot of heavy lifting will have to be done by all of us, collectively to get investors, to get NGOs to come on, right? As the track record gets built, then the distribution channels like Zerodha, like the other brokers, will have to start taking on that responsibility of distributing these products. I actually don't know if there's a commission, Malab, I don't know the incentive structure yet, okay? <laughs> I have no idea about the incentive structure. Right, right. But eventually, we'll have to democratize it. Yeah. it. Yeah, no, I mean, the way we've been thinking about it is that we can potentially peer pressure uh, to get others to participate as well. Like, you know, if, if you know, we are the leading broker in the country, we offer it and we talk about it. We can then kind of nudge the ecosystem to also do it. You know? yeah. So I was actually talking to, you know, I've been on the Rangde platform for a while, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, to Ram just now, which is, we've been evaluating, you know, Rangde for a while. And every time I, I come on the platform, I, I've been participating, but but my question usually is, how does someone trust the platform, right? And uh, well, Ram and Rangde has done quite well, uh, but I think it's very it's hard to scale that. And do you see an opportunity for a Rangde type of platform to come on? the social stock exchange as well, as in, because th these are, each farmer is a mini project, right? As in, like each artisan is a mini project, or is that too much, as in? See, the, and Ram and I have had this discussion, right? So part of the challenge is that he's operating in a space called P2P lending, right? P2P lending has its own set of regulations, its own set of structures they need to follow, which may not be conducive strictly to a stock exchange kind of platform. Um, but a crowdfunding kind, uh, I think yeah, the correct. direction of yeah, your question yeah, yeah. was actually... Yeah, can a crowdfunding yes, kind of initiative that come? I think can be possible. Just like liquid funds, you can put in even 100 rupees, right? As an example, right? So people will want to put 101 rupees in this case. Um, uh, so I think even Abhito's... You, Think about they've set a limit of two lakhs, right? We have to bring that down. But I think, yeah, it, to answer your question, eventually, this is yes. eventually it's yeah. a, it should. That'll be nice. Yeah. As part of the capacity building fund, so I was reading a bunch of documents on what has happened globally. So the one of the uh, points that kept sticking out is that most people won't have the capability to understand the intricacies of a capital market ecosystem. Come list the projects. So like, what's the remit of the capacity building fund? Would it also entail? sensitizing potential organizations about, you know, what's the capabilities, yeah. what are the possibilities? Yeah. So it includes, so like I said, issuers and investors or NGOs and donors. Not, so not, for-profit enterprises are not included in their remit. 
only not for profit enterprises are included uh, donors are e included in their remit and i think th what they are also trying to figure out is that at least for the initial few issues if they can underwrite some of the costs involved like the social audit cost we spoke about right if they can underwrite some of the costs involved just to get the engine going they'll probably look at that also so but how would the uh, the fund be replenished in the sense that assuming that there was a bootstrap phase where there's a lot of heavy costs involved like how would the fund be replenished who bears the cost of it the total corpus is about 100 crores some amount nabard was putting in some amount sidbi was putting in some amount the stock exchange was putting in and then there was also this bucket i forget what the exact amount was but there was bucket that other philanthropic organizations were putting for a, the other point that came up in all these documents is that organizations have ongoing costs and that tends to be one of their biggest uh, challenges at least you know as an outsider reading it like can they raise funds for running the organization or is it at a project level see structurally there's nothing stock it's a stock market right think about it as a stock market if i can find people who will buy my zero coupon zero principle that is to fund my corpus or for my operating cost so there's no clear there's no market. unlike a csr or there's no restriction right as long as you can find people you fit into that framework uh, you you can go ahead and do it what is restricted today because uh, this will get asked um, is foreign funds are restricted today csr funds are restricted today and once you issue a like is there a, a duration limit for the bond in the sense it could be a perpetual instrument also but a perpetual will be tough because there's no trading right a perpetual typically is when just lies in your demand <laughs> yeah yeah maybe yeah we should we should ask if there are questions <laughs> when we had met in april you had mentioned about csr not being allowed on the platform as yet because of various reasons that you had mentioned i'm picking up a couple of things that nitin mentioned earlier about the cost of the commissions to be paid and the social auditor cost and all of that now a lot of that cost the way i see it can actually get absorbed or reduced if people like csr are allowed onto the platform because today the other challenge that csos have is reporting now we've got to and typically a cso a large cso will have like 40 odd csrs funding them each csr having their own reporting structure so the finance team and the program team of that cso is actually 40% of the time goes in preparing the reports and if that can move to the sse with a standardized reporting structure lot of the cost here actually goes down and it can fund the social auditor and you know commission that needs to be paid and all of that so can we sometimes see that happening sometime i don't know sometime in the future there are multiple answers to your question okay. the the easiest answer is csr is another donor right and any donor even a non csr donor has to be able to recognize that there are administration costs in running a project and therefore should be able to willing to fund typically even in a csr scenario individual projects have individual donors it's normally a one to one relationship right therefore the reporting that you have to do at that project level is for one donor so you're not reporting the same project in five different formats to five different donors to an extent i don't know if the social stock exchange is an answer to that part of the question because it will bring in other costs it may not have a customized reporting cost but you'll have a social audit cost you'll have a disclosure cost you'll have compliance cost you right annual renewal cost there are other costs that will come into the picture the reason why to my mind csr in its current form is not a suitable answer for the social stock exchange is that the recent amendments have made csr so as an example you can at the most have a duration of 3 years right even within and you have to declare it as an ongoing project even if within that 3 years you have to provide annual budgets right and if you don't spend that annual budget there is some school of thought it has to go back you can't do that on a stock exchange right you have 100 people who've given you money 
on March 31st, will you return everybody's money and say April 1st, give it back to me? That's not going to work. So in the current construct, the way CSR is today, I don't think it is possible to do it on social stock exchange. I mean, there is a school of thought where you can say that I have a six-month project, why can't I do it? Right. You can make that argument, but in a generic sense, CSR with its amendments that have happened over the last two years, I have not, I have taken it in the other direction. It's like trying to put P2P lending onto the stock exchange. Maybe the, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs will come out with provisions that will allow ZCZP instruments not be subject to some of these amendments that are there. So the argument I am making to the wider government is that your even in FCRA, right, your purpose behind tightening the screws is to actually provide transparency into end user funds. That is the objective. That is a stated objective. Right? If I am on the social stock exchange with an annual social audit happening, right, I should be achieving that objective. Why aren't you letting me but their reverse argument is some of the questions that these gentlemen ask. How do I know what will happen to the funds? What if shady organization comes and take advantage of the system? You please stabilize your platform first. You get a few issues, right? Let's see how it works and then we'll do all this. Like why is there no standardized reporting in the social? Why is that not happening? So yet? I'll tell you a story, okay? 2016 when I started with Saman, I actually came with these very idealistic thoughts about the social development. Right? And at that time, to 2015 is when the CSR thing came, right? the Companies Act. And one of the first thing most NGOs I talked to told me, sir, we will not raise CSR funds. We will never raise CSR funds because of what he just said. They want every quarter they want a report, everybody has a different format. They have a board meeting, they'll say by 6 p.m. give me the data for the project. right? But now every NGO is tapping into the CSR well right? because there is a cost benefit. So believe me, the social stock exchange is also no cakewalk. Right? There are costs, there are hurdles that will be there when you come and list. But I think if we can create a vibrant ecosystem out of it, those things will also be acceptable. I have a question. Yes. One now even MCA website has come out with uh, bridging the gap between NGOs and corporate. So they are saying you list your project. So we will bridge that gap. Corporates can fund it. Well, first question is how different SSC, how this can benefit uh, NGOs. Second question is uh, even to motivate corporate, it sh uh, CSR is not covered under uh, SSC or even they won't get ATG benefit. So what has to really motivate? The MCA platform you're talking about is called the National CSR Exchange. Correct. Right? It was launched in June 7th of last year. It is actually Samman which has been rechristened as, re-architected and rechristened as National CSR Exchange. So I'm very familiar with that pro platform. Um, that is, so some of the stock exchanges in other countries did something similar. It is more of a listing platform, right? Either the corporate can come and say, these are my requirements and get, or like an RFP and get proposals or an NGO can say that these are my projects for which I'm wanting to raise funds. Corporates can come and pick up a project from there. Um, it is not matchmaking. It is not funding. It is not to, to use something that Nitin said. It's not a crowdfunding platform. Right? And I'm using that word crowd carefully right now because there's a two lakh minimum <laughs> investor limit, right? But the, what I'm trying to say is that it is not a, a transactional platform. Okay, it is an informational platform. Yes. 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 That's the big difference. And, and I don't think this is solving for that problem anyways. This it's is not, not solving for the CSR no. yeah. uh, identifying projects. Correct. So the genesis behind that platform, by the way, is there's a high-level committee that was set up in 2019, where basically they were told that CSR is not effective. Right At that point, most of the companies that were not spending the CSR fund used to write one line in their annual report saying could not find a good project. So MCA was told, build a platform so that these people don't have this excuse. I have two questions. So first is, uh, 
I mean, the way stock exchange distinguishes between a retail investor and an institutional investor, like say when an IPO comes out, the rules are different for retail versus institutional. So one is, will the stock, uh, social stock exchange distinguish between the two? And uh, the second question is slightly, um, I mean, uh, I come from a foundation, I mean, sort of, I, I work for the Tata Trust and one one thing that I see in the financing space uh, when it comes to um, social sector projects is that social change takes time. And uh, one thing I find is that when you put money behind causes versus projects, um, sometimes you get very different results. I mean, if all of your funding is always very programmatic in nature, it has its limitations. <laughs> So what I'm wondering about is, and also the other aspect, when it comes to causes, some causes, like if I look at, say, um, children in India, right? Like, I mean, I work in education. Um, when it comes to programs that are around literacy of children, it's easy to raise funds. But there are there is there is a spectrum of childhood which is very amorphous to us, like say children on the streets and you know children in childcare institutions. So what I'm also coming to is when it comes to causes. Um, I mean, how can I mean what could be the mechanisms in the social stock exchange so that causes which for which it is difficult to raise money typically are able to raise more money. Um, and secondly, how can it be more cause-led rather than uh, program-led? So the first uh, the first question is the easier one. So I'll <laughs> as of now, there is no, so as an example, IPOs have this quota, institutional quota, et cetera. There's no, technically there's no distinction between any investor putting in money into a zero coupon, zero principle, right? Or for that matter, a social impact fund or a development impact bond. As of now, there's no distinction. What may happen in the future, I don't know. So that's the easy question. The, on the second piece, um, so there are two, two ways to answer that question. Okay? One is that I said 95% of NGOs raise money at a project level. 5% of NGOs do not raise money at a project level. They raise money typically at an organizational level. As an example, the one I met very recently, so it's top of mind for me, is I was in Jaipur and I met these guys who make that Jaipur foot, right? And now it's an arm and a lot of other limbs also. It is an operation, right? A guy walks in with a disability, he walks out with an artificial limb. There are no projects. You talked about a perpetual instrument, right? So there is technically, you can actually issue a 99 year old zero coupon zero principle and say, Give me funding. Of course, it's unlikely that they spend like 30 crores in a year, right? So it's unlikely that 30 into 100, 3,000 crores, ZCZ people. So, but they can come to the platform and say, for the next five years, my requirement is 100 crores, right? And find people who will put in money for that five years, three years, whatever the market, uh, they understand their donors. So um, do you, sorry, do you have to specify that while raising? How yeah, the, the tenor has to. Tenor has to be specified. Also, the purpose there has to be. Yeah. Purpose. To an extent, uh, it's not meant to be only project financing. Okay. The bigger question, which I did not answer in the first go, was the fact that, like you said, some causes are amorphous, right, and therefore the outcomes are also amorphous. How will you fit that into a social audit construct is the bigger question to my mind. One of the disadvantages of this social audit piece is that you're quantifying everything. And in this space, everything cannot be quantified. But that's a challenge that I think the uh, social development sector intrinsically faces, right? People talk about social rate of return, SROI, etc. But all of them try and quantify something that fundamentally you unless somebody comes up with something really exotic, uh, is fundamentally not quantifiable. So that problem will be there. I mean, that is an intrinsic problem in the e ecosystem, we, and this is not solving it. I'm sorry, one follow-up on the social, just to belay the point. Um, it's a very fraught process, the social audit. And I mean, even with accounting where everything is tangible, you know, people are arguing about in gap, whatever, etc. Like, to your mind, as things stand, the NISM module on how auditors should go with the job. Is that good enough to start? No, no. 
it's to start with there it's they've developed something based on collective wisdom of people they've consulted with it's not stood the test of time it'll evolve and it will matlab audit by its very nature is one person saying a and the other person saying b right and the two will be in conflict they will be conflict especially with done quantifiables <laughs> I have a question, uh, Hemanji, about uh, the T plus three that you mentioned. The T plus two weeks, uh, NGOs that want to list on the platform have to uh, do all the legwork earlier in order to find the funders. And we are talking here about some institutional investors and retail investors, uh, and then there are the CSR investors who are outside of it. So, don't you think the uh, it it becomes an onerous task for a uh, NGO to list, like to to do all this leg legwork? and then come in list what are your thoughts about that i had alluded to some level of an answer to your question earlier there is an effort required to kick start this engine right but why are we trying to kick start this engine the so the effort you are talking about any fundraising requires that effort whether it's a company wanting to do an ipo whether even if you want to raise csr fund for any fundraising requires effort you can't just come to a platform and magically hope that funds will uh, come the other way to put that question is what is the extra thing that the social stock exchange is bringing to the table which which is why you should be on the social stock exchange there is an initial effort that is required to get this thing to fly in that initial phase we will have to put an effort all of us will have to put an extra effort to do that fundraising right the reason why we should be putting in that extra effort is that tomorrow if i want to invest money donate money to that project in kaziranga sitting in bangalore or bombay i should have that option right and that option will be available to me as a common donor only and only if we are able to make the social stock exchange a success so i i'm not answering your question directly i'm answering it in a roundabout way collectively if we want the social social development ecosystem in this country to go beyond the doors of the csrs to go beyond the doors of the i'm sorry to the tata trusts and you know the foundations rain, rain matter foundation to the larger public that cannot happen i'm sure there can be other ways of doing it but the easiest way to do that is to be able to tap into the 1.2 crore accounts that i on the zero dha platform right and you will have to we will have to put in that initial effort to get to that point i was wondering what was the logic behind maybe having dibs development impact bonds listed on the exchange uh, so the reason i asked this is because we've been trying to put together a dib uh, where you have a, a philanthropic investor putting in the the risk investment and then the carbon market is actually the outcomes buyer uh, but this process has been so complicated and like you rightly alluded to the fact that sometimes measuring these things is very expensive so because measuring these things is expensive you need a very large project size to be able to just justify putting in 20% of the cost you know for monitoring and evaluation structuring all of these things uh so how does the social stock exchange make this process simpler it doesn't okay <laughs> so uh, where are you from madam uh i'm from uh, farmers for forests what you're alluding to is an intrinsic nature of the activity you're trying to carry out right um the social stock exchange will make it easier for you to find outcome funders and risk investors but the intrinsic architecture that you're trying to put together which is this dib which has a risk component and the operational component right that it cannot change so if a monitoring agency is going to need 20% of the funds then it's going to need 20% of the funds right but do you think having multiple because one of the things we also spent a lot of time on was explaining to risk investors or explaining to outcome funders how this works so having multiple risk investors as is the case in a social stock exchange or multiple outcome funders does not complicate the process more because now you're explaining to 10 people instead of 
one and you're getting 10 people yeah. into the I, you're fold. Right. You're absolutely right. It will be more complicated. Um, it will be more complicated. Part of the reason for that, to my mind, is that the language, the lexicon for a DIB is not very popular. right? And therefore, it's an effort to explain to everybody what is a DIB, what are the benefits, etc. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think we'll have to walk that path. So yeah, so short term, you're absolutely right. I don't think the social stock exchange will help. And then just another like related question, because we're seeing this in the carbon markets as well. Uh, what happens when you have like a social stock exchange or a carbon market or things like that? The paperwork is so complicated and there's so much information asymmetry that the organizations that are actually working on the ground, uh, but that, that don't have access to this vocabulary or this understanding, uh, can really not leverage the real benefit. And then you have a lot of these um, middle agencies that mushroom up uh, where they are playing the role of consultants. So like we see this in the carbon markets. Yep. I can imagine this happening in the, the social stock exchange as sure. well. So how do you, I mean, how do we put in guardrails or safeguards to prevent this, to make sure that the money actually yeah. goes to no, the organizations on the ground? And uh, I think we'll have to take, we, it's currently not a priority area for us. But you're 100% right, we will have to address this as we go along, as we build this and get more and more sectors uh, as a part of the social stock exchange. You're absolutely right. We'll have to think about this one also. I agree. Two niche questions, very short. Um, one is about matchmaking and how both parties need to be happy with each other. And sometimes NGOs might actually decline funding from some donors. Um, and I wonder whether it's uh, be a way here, once you've listed your project on the stock exchange, whether there might be a way to politely decline um, a, a donor or investor. That's number one. And the second is taking from your example of rhinos in Kaziranga. They, that does follow under one of the 15 um, areas of work, I think, protection of wildlife and forests. Yes, However, in the eligibility, it talks about beneficiaries and it talks about population, which I'm assuming means human beneficiaries and human population, uh, unless that is defined more broadly. So yeah. what about projects that um, either don't have human beneficiaries necessarily or where um, they are more diffuse, like, for example, ecological restoration projects uh, where uh, it's hard to identify, let alone count human beneficiaries? First question on excluding certain donors. I actually, <laughs> I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I had not thought of this also. <laughs> uh, no, but but can, you know, I think the question there is, you know, in a normal scenario, the donors potentially can interfere in, you know, in your daily operations and etc. Here, through the social stock exchange, it's just an intermediate, right? Yeah. So it it is you you your investor never gets to interact with you yeah. as such, right? No, but that, that's just to add. That's not the only reason why one might not, like you know, for example, let's say there's a company that has a factory that's polluting groundwater, and you're working with the villages around there that are affected, and maybe you're not even working on water, but your credibility with your, um, with the people you work with. There is no way you would know that you received funds from such an organization because of the way the exchange works. There no, you would. No right? There'd be no way. No, I know that. You, would, you wouldn't know who bought. The I would know through right? the public, public issue. Yeah. No, no, I'm I'm sure sure. See, they, I, I'll tell you, uh, ultimately, uh, there is an allocation that needs to happen, right? So when you subscribe to something, ultimately you get allocated the shares that you bought. Therefore, theoretically, there can be a process where the NGO actually vets each donor before allocating the units to them, right? That is something that the NGO will need to manage. Right? There's, we, as the stock exchange, will actually not play a role in it. That's between something known as an RTA, which is a registrar and transfer agent, and the NGO to manage. Right? And you can do that. Um, I think the point that Bhuvan was trying to make is that by democratizing this whole process of donation, the amount of effort that you will have to do to take that needle out from the haystack, right? It's just not going to be worth the effort. 
right? It's it's okay for you to do it when you have three donors in a project, five donors in a project. You can afford to do that KYC, right? But to do it at a stock exchange scale, it may not be worth doing it. But that's your call. To be honest, it's entirely your call. What do you say, Nitin, right? Uh, the second one is uh, where uh, I can probably pro provide a more substantial answer. Uh, that one, so if you look at uh, the 67% criteria, it talks about revenue, expenses, and beneficiaries. So there is an expenses number. So the, the idea behind the expenses and beneficiaries was that sometimes, especially in volunteer-based organizations, the expenses don't really reflect the true nature of your work. Right? So if you have a lot of volunteers that are putting in free time to provide the service that you're providing to the, the people who need it, expenses will not always add up to a 67%. So the idea behind putting the beneficiary was that for such organizations, you can also use the beneficiary metric to justify that you're a social enterprise. And like I said, the fourth criteria, which is underserved and underprivileged and priority areas is actually a, it's not a filter. It is a preference. Because recognizing the fact that you can't capture everything, the entire breadth of what is being done, we should give a preference to organizations that are working with the underserved, that are working in the underdeveloped areas. And there's nothing stopping us from saying that a place that needs ec ecological restoration is not an underdeveloped area, right? So that, that part is, I can answer that it's not excluded. The first question is something that you guys will have to figure out whether you want to continue with it or... I think I have three questions for you. Wow. One, <laughs> one I think, uh, at least the larger discussion uh, we were having for last one and a half hour, that people can invest in the civil society, right? Yeah. But in the development sector, last four, five years, uh, the work has been beyond the NGOs, right? A lot of community collectives, whether it is a women collective or a farmer collectives, are coming up. And they are doing tremendously good work, supported by a lot of us. But can they also raise money from the social stock exchange? So a woman collective or uh, typically is a, is it a cooperative or a company? It is so a company registered exists. under the Producer Company Act. But it's not a, comp a Section 8 kind of company, right? It's a, no, it's a for, either for-profit company, right? Yes. So a for-profit company can... Pro pro can producer company can yeah. raise money. Yeah. Okay. I mean, see, okay. Let me rephrase that. I said yes to uh, fast. Okay. <laughs> a stock exchange normally has eligibility criteria. Right? A for-profit company typically gets fitted into three segments. The main board, the SME segment, or the startup segment. Each of these segments has their own eligibility criteria as to what your net worth, what your turnover, your years of operation. So as long as you fit into the eligibility criteria of one of those segments, sure, you can raise money. Okay. Then the second question, can panchayats also, village panchayats also raise money under SSE? Is it a legal entity? Yes. Uh, what? Is it a Section 8 company? Say, uh, society, trust or Section 8 company? No, it is certainly not under three of them. Okay. So as of now, the regulation is you have to be either a society, trust or a Section 8 company. Okay, so then these community institutions need to depend on people like us to raise money from the social stock exchange. That's then correct. need to be got back to the villages. And you can always make a representation oh. saying that we need to include village panchayats also. I just don't know social audit. We'll have to figure out the entire cycle. And my second question was around, uh, will social audit alone be an effective tool to measure all of this work? No. Okay, because we have big, big well, learnings from the uh, larger rural development schemes that are run in this country. No, no, so so let audit. me be very clear. Um, and I, I think we spoke about it when we were discussing. Um, quantification of the outcomes of, the, of a social development project is an, I don't know whether to call it an art or a science, but it's not there, right? Uh, and therefore, uh, the social audit, therefore, will be limited in, in what it will produce. 
but in today's scenario we don't have a better way to measure what is being produced if there is a better way to measure what is being produced which everybody will understand then we should adopt that but remember the the reporting has to be objective currently measurable and what is called repeatable which means that if somebody else came and did the same exercise again they'll come up with the same result that's the three things that we normally follow in an audit process and my third question uh, currently under the uh, fundraising mechanisms we do a lot of foundations or organizations through the csr they do have an independent teams right so they do have a csr teams that do due diligence and also visit the field then during the uh, project implementation phase also they do come and visit us and multiple verification checks and balances are there during the project period so if i am a retail investor and i am investing through the social stock exchange who will do all of this work so um, there are uh, disclosures so if you raise funds on the social stock exchange as an ngo you actually have to make regular disclosures right and the the regular the, there are there are disclosures at one time disclosures at the time of fundraising there are quarterly disclosures there are event based disclosures and there are annual disclosures okay. that have to be done which highlight anything that impacts the health of the project okay the second is that on an annual basis you have to get a social audit done so therefore the social audit is supposed to be one the other method mechanism for communicating what's happening with your money so which is why when i put in money in, into kaziranga i'll know what is happening to those rhinos so question you actually extension to that so in the for profit space sebi takes corporate governance very seriously right as in right and that's really why the trust is there to invest into companies so would sebi kind of play a similar similar role in the social stock exchange you know which kind of covers because today you know in the social sector i think companies are used to people coming and auditing versus just being listed on the exchange and self disclosing right and then which is how because none of us have ever gone to you know any of the stock that i own and say you know show me this right you know so right so would do you think that can eventually happen in the space because of the social stock exchange that is uh more accountability more uh, like you know the the social sector itself disclosing more and not having to worry about so many people from so many corporates coming i mean eventually can this trigger something like that see i think somewhere the reason for pushing the social sector onto the social stock exchange has to be what you just said right that there are automatic mechanisms that provide more transparency there are these governance stru- governance structures that are in place um but i think uh, to again going back to what he asked and what she also asked um finding those structures for the social development space might take a little more time right? what exactly so as you know th- for example there is an annual social audit actually when in the technical group uh, i was fighting for a semi annual social audit right because i said once a year is not frequent enough things on the ground change a lot more frequently but the counter argument had been that that's an extra cost right so we have agreed to annual social audit but i think some of these things with time will stabilize into their own cycles their own reporting formats so there are for profits for instance a few we have invested in who are also creating public goods uh with beneficiaries or you know improved ecosystem benefits and so on and so forth so when we uh when we are looking at for profit participation right now they are taking the cost on their bottom lines right is it is it uh imagined that these folks can actually create uh through the social stock exchange uh instruments for reducing the cost for themselves while they produce these public goods um uh, is that whether they are listed or not is that is that part of the intent what instrument what does this instrument look like for a for profit organization no i would not treat it any different from any other commercial organization so to the extent that you can maybe float a bond for a specific purpose you can do that um 
the 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 thing is that uh, impact investment tends to be a very again a very exclusive and closed ecosystem right so the idea behind putting for profit enterprises onto the social stock exchange and nitin asked a similar question was that can i as an individual tomorrow contribute to uh, rangde which is a right uh, not to a specific fund of rangde but to rangde as an organization um and participate in both the social return and maybe a financial return um so so that the, that's the basic philosophy now how we, that specific organization wants to raise money for what objectives etc that would be left to the organization if i understood your question right yeah so there's flexibility on the kind of yeah. the objectives that the yeah. bond and uh, also on the kind of returns it could be a zero coupon zero it's a market well. right Got ultimately it. um will the investors or uh, the donors here will they have any voting rights i assume you don't want to take money from certain people but if you don't have voting rights then you are fine so who gets voting rights people who are shareholders yes right yes so here here that conceptual no my other question was that uh, um, you mentioned that the uh, two thirds of the money uh, will be allocated to the beneficiary or the expenses that is the past history of that organization if mm. that changes in future is there yeah. would there be any mechanism so, to address that so yeah. that is the criteria for registration first time that you come on to the social stock exchange that criteria allows you to get in okay now the, if you are a not for profit you register yourself which is subject to an annual renewal right so if next year you don't fulfill that criteria your registration will be revoked and you will no longer be able to raise funds but any fundraising you've already done yes right you will not stays with you stays with you, right Sim- on the for profit side if you do an ipo based on this 67% and next year you fall out to that 67% that ipo is done yes right so there there's no return of funds sure but the next time you come to the social stock exchange you will not be eligible for further fundraising got and also uh, will there be any upper cap to raising capital so which instrument are you talking about zero so, coupon no, zero principal no. no upper cap you have to find funders i mean you have to find people who understood will understood pay you that much money yeah yeah no but but uh, if you if this yeah yeah the, the chances of scamming is much higher if you can raise say say 500 crore if as in you you only done for 1 crore worth of work and people are giving people will, you money people should watch it crore, <laughs> then, no, no, people they should watch it lose that money yeah, yeah yeah so on a more serious note partly that 2 lakh limit that sebi has put i don't like the limit but there's actually a rationale behind it today when a donor gives you money he'll do due diligence he'll people will come every quarter look at the work you're doing expect reports on a stock exchange you will not do any of these things yeah to what nitin was saying to start with the 2 lakh limit actually think makes some sense right that the guy who's investing that money putting that money into your organization into your project he has some level of understanding of what he's getting into got right and therefore uh if he loses sure understood yeah thanks yeah so thanks <laughs> thanks sure. aiman for doing this i didn't realize it took 2 hours of yours and thanks everyone for coming no. um uh, yeah i guess we're done <laughs> no thank you everybody <laughs> <It's> all great <laughs>